Advertising is everywhere these days. We see it when we're scrolling social media, when we're walking down the street, and it's probably just a matter of time before they're beaming ads into our dreams. Estimates suggest that the average person is exposed to anywhere from a few hundred to well over a thousand ads every single day, including everything from billboards and banner ads to video ads. You may have seen one before watching this video. Thanks for not skipping. With so much background noise, it's rare for any particular campaign to stand out from the crowd. If an advertiser really wants to capture people's attention, a mere commercial just isn't enough. It's going to take something big to get people talking. Really, really big. Or, failing that, really, really weird. A proper marketing stunt is designed to generate discussion and, by extension, publicity that will hopefully translate into sales. Oftentimes, it doesn't matter if it's good publicity or bad publicity, and just as long as it gets people talking, it's done its job. And boy, oh boy, are there some moments from the games industry worth talking about. At least ten of them, in fact, shall we? Let's look at some. I'm Ben from Triple Jump, and here are the ten weirdest video game marketing stunts. Number 10. Happy Birthday, Doverkeen! Nowadays, it seems like Skyrim is the last game that would need any kind of promotional gimmick, but there was a time when it wasn't thought of as the generation-defining smash hit it's known as today, and even Bethesda weren't above a spot of gimmicky marketing. In January 2011, they announced that any parents who named their newborn child Doverkeen, the moniker of the game's main character, would receive a Steam key with access to every Bethesda game ever published, past, present, and future, for the rest of their lives. The only catch was that the bouncing baby dragon born had to be born on November the 11th of that year, the same day that Skyrim was set to release. It seems that there was only one pair of takers. Eric and Megan Kellermeyer, a husband and wife, welcomed their son Doverkeen into the world on November the 11th, 2011. Bethesda reached out to congratulate the family and discuss their prize. With their son approaching puberty, the couple say they have no regrets about the name and are happy to be able to share such a bond with him. They also confirmed that Bethesda were true to their word and their Steam library continues to swell. And who says gaming can't be fun for the whole family? Probably the child would have a few words, I imagine. Number 9. Rise and Fall of the Six String Rock and roll rhythm games were big business in the early 2000s, to the point that you couldn't swing a cat in a video game store without hitting a few instrument-shaped controllers. Guitar Hero and Rock Band were the undisputed headliners, but power gig Rise of the Six String was a third-party offering looking for a slice of the pie. Built on the idea of creating a more true-to-life music experience, the game was packaged with a real functioning electric guitar that was also used as the game's controller, so players could, in theory, learn to play the real thing as they were jamming out in-game. Power Gig's developers thought they'd stick it to the man with a targeted ad that saw a pile of their competition's guitar controllers thrown from a helicopter and into an active volcano. It was meant as just a jab, but ended up sparking outrage over the ecological ramifications of dumping hundreds of pounds of plastic into molten lava. Because yes, that's an extremely bad thing to do, you idiots. Thankfully, they later revealed that the volcano footage was faked, but it didn't do much to help as the game flopped hard. Pretending to release toxic fumes into the atmosphere, that's not very metal at all. Number 8. Your Mum Hates Dead Space 2 did anybody else ever notice as a youth how parents always seemed to walk in at the worst possible moment of any game that you were playing? Or was that just me? Well, the idea of scandalizing your parents seemed relatable enough that EA decided to bank on it to advertise their sequel to Dead Space. To do this, they ran an advert entitled Your Mom Hates Dead Space 2, in which a focus group of mothers was invited to watch some of the grossest and goriest scenes from the game and share their reactions, which were, by and large, absolute disgust. The ad was clearly effective as Dead Space 2 outsold the original almost two to one at launch, but it raised questions over the dubious nature of its production. For one thing, the women in the commercial weren't paid actresses as they were just normal middle-aged women brought in under the pretense of a marketing study and asked to view footage that clearly made them rather uncomfortable. Secondly, the ad's tagline suggests that it's targeting young teenagers who still live with their parents, even though the game itself was rated the equivalent of M or 18 plus in most regions where it was released. Not illegal, but certainly a little suspect. Number 7. The Million Dollar Video Game you don't need me to tell you that Video Game Collector's Editions have gotten pretty over the top, but I'm going to anyway. 
No longer should your expectations be limited to just a pin or a poster. These days games can come packaged with art books, soundtrack CDs and statuettes hefty enough to bludgeon a man to death with. But no game has ever offered up anything even remotely close to what the devs at Volition put up for grabs with the release of Saints Row 4. On top of the standard limited edition that came with a statuette and a replica dubstep gun, they also offered the succinctly named Super Dangerous Wad Wad Edition, whose contents made the regular limited edition look paltry by comparison. In addition to the statuette and gun, this deluxe version included two week-long stays at luxury hotels, a Lamborghini and a Prius, plastic surgery, a trip to space from Virgin Galactic, a hostage rescue experience, and more. All of this, and the game of course, could be yours for the reasonable sum of one million US dollars. While the existence of such an exorbitant package seemed like little more than a joke, this special edition was genuinely put up for sale through UK retailer Games website. Only one copy was available, but it seems nobody ever bought it. Can't imagine why. Number 6. Buy Just Cause 3, Win an Island Imagine kicking back on a tropical beach, enjoying the sand and the surf with a drink in your hand and not a care in the world. This dream was set to become the reality of one lucky player of Just Cause 3, with a few strings attached. To promote the release of the upcoming threequel, Square Enix announced a rather interesting contest. 90 days after the game's release, the player with the most chaos points earned by causing in-game mayhem and destruction would be awarded their very own private island. There were a few caveats to this prize, however, namely said winner would be responsible for any fees and taxes associated with purchasing and owning the island, which, given the prize's dollar value was stated at $50,000, would be quite hefty. And if you're thinking it's still worth it to have your own private resort, there was also no guarantee that the island would even be habitable, so there was every chance you'd end up with a $50,000 nuclear waste disposal site. Sounds quite fun, actually. It was never announced who actually won this contest, but we're inclined to believe that whoever it was opted for the cash prize alternative. Number 5. THQ Advocates for Breaking and Entering Say you were walking along the street and you saw a dog trapped in a car on a hot day. You'd want to save that dog, wouldn't you? Now replace the word dog with stack of video games and... Yeah, that analogy isn't going anywhere near as well. The Red Faction series made a name for itself by offering players unprecedented freedom in destructible sandbox environments. Perhaps inspired by this do-anything-smash-everything mentality, publisher THQ announced that they would be storing 100 copies of their newest title, Red Faction Guerrilla, inside of a parked car left unattended somewhere in London. Anyone who walked past the car was encouraged to pick up the sledgehammer conveniently placed nearby, smash a window, and snag a copy for themselves. THQ THQ defended the stunt as a social experiment to see what kind of behaviour people would engage in if given the opportunity to do something otherwise forbidden. This is the kind of stunt that goes beyond what the hell were they thinking and straight into how the hell did this get approved. Advocating for theft and property damage seems like it would be legally murky, to put it lightly. Don't worry, THQ wasn't that irresponsible. The provided sledgehammer was attached to a chain. Wouldn't want anyone stealing it, after all. Number 4. The PSP again. We've talked about some of the PlayStation Portable's marketing blunders in previous videos, but it turns out that we had only scratched the surface. Sony's first foray into the arena of handheld gaming was backed by some absolutely bonkers marketing campaigns, including a few holiday stunts that had people scratching their heads. In 2005, Sony hired graffiti artists in seven major cities to spray paint pictures of children playing with PSPs onto the sides of buildings. This tactic was meant to attract what Sony called urban nomads, but drew the ire of both what does that mean? But drew the ire of both neighbourhood locals and city officials who denounced the ads as tasteless and potentially illegal. Local graffiti artists took issue as well, and often defaced the ads within days. Things got weirder in 2006 when a website called All I Want For Christmas Is A PSP.com began circulating the internet. The website, which had the appearance of a blog run by two boys, featured only one major piece of content, a homemade music video of a young man rapping about his yuletide desire for a Sony handheld. People weren't fooled and quickly outed the supposed fan site as a production by a marketing agency. Sony fessed up and quickly deleted the site, though not before this Christmas carol for the modern age was preserved forever on YouTube. Here's a snippet. Game so crazy. They totally amaze me. Gotta ask my mom for one. For shizzy. PSP. PSP. Oh, Jesus, it's horrible. Number 3. Get insulted by Schooljager. Or Schooljager, I don't know how to pronounce that. Thanks for watching, pig slime. Uh, sorry.
thought I'd try this new thing where I insult you to make you want to watch more videos. No, I didn't think it was going to work either, but apparently someone who worked at ASC Games did. As part of their promotion for Skull, Skull Yaga, Jaeger, Revolt of the Westicans, ad began appearing in magazines inviting readers to call the Skull ya Skull j the Skull Jagger Hotline. While that may sound odd, this wasn't an uncommon practice back in the 80s and 90s, and also early 2000s. Many companies had a tip hotline players could call if they got stuck in a game, and some had dedicated lines that connected callers to the fictional characters themselves. Freddy Freaker was a thing. Skull Jagger played things a bit differently, however. Anybody who dared to dial the number would get to hear the voice of the game's bony antagonist, yes, but rather than recycling promotional taglines and catchphrases, the titular Captain Skull Jagger would berate the caller. He would insult their gaming skills, calling them a useless quaking pus bag and a disgrace to their pimply girlfriends and several other things that were just downright rude, really. It's a bold marketing strategy to be sure, but considering that the publisher went out of business only a few years later, it's clearly not one that paid off. Number 2. Mass Effect in Space Mass Effect 3, I know, I, I know, but we're not talking about the game's ending today, rather we're here to talk about its launch, or lack thereof, as the case may be. Several weeks before the game's hotly anticipated release, EA announced that they would be attaching several copies of Mass Effect 3 to high-altitude weather balloons and sending them into low orbit in the stratosphere, so not quite out of space, but as good as. Enterprising players would be able to track the GPS coordinates of the balloons, and anyone who found a copy as it fell to Earth would be free to keep it. Problems arose almost immediately when the GPS tracking failed to work, forcing EA to instead constantly tweet out the present coordinates of each balloon. This made actually tracking the darn things, you know, the entire point of the whole stunt, a crapshoot for anyone who was actually following them. At least one balloon immediately ran into a tree, several landed on private property and were never accounted for, and the planned launch in the Paris area had to be cancelled due to a snafu with French airspace regulations. Sounds like a rocky start to a game with a rocky ending. Ah, <laughs> oh, damn, I said I wasn't going to mention that, was I? Sorry. Number 1. What would you do for a GameCube? The Nintendo GameCube may not have been the most powerful or successful console of its generation, but that doesn't mean it didn't have its own contingent of dedicated supporters. Just how dedicated were they? Nintendo themselves decided to find out. Ahead of the console's US launch in November 2001, Nintendo of America held a contest asking fans to perform some kind of wild or crazy stunt of their own to show their dedication to the big N. The person who was willing to go the farthest would win a prize package including a GameCube and $5,000. The contest's five fights the lists included a man who juggled three Nintendo consoles whilst whistling the Mario theme, a boy who painted the GameCube logo with his tongue, a man who proposed to his girlfriend while in Mario and Peach cosplay, oh that's nice, and a girl who ate a replica GameCube made of cat food and chocolate syrup. Just give it to her, please. But there could only be one grand prize winner, and that honour went to Corey Olksvery, who made himself into a human Pikmin by shaving his head, painting his body blue, and eating an assortment of insects that he called Pikmin. Pikmin food. Now, we here at Triple Jump certainly love our video games, but as the song says, I would do anything for love, but I won't do that. No thanks. Hope it was worth it, Corey. 